Hey everyone, welcome to Judging for the Win. I'm Dave, and this is my daily ruling. Today is this month's patron pick, which means that the topic was suggested and voted for by my supporters on Patreon. Thanks to all of you, and I really love this topic. I was excited to see it win because I think it's a really interesting one. So let's get started and talk about how loops and shortcuts work in Magic. So first of all, I want to talk a little bit about what the difference is between loops and shortcuts. So for the purposes of this presentation, we're going to say that a loop is a series of game actions that leads to the game ending up in the same or substantially similar state as when it started. Uh, again, it doesn't have to be exactly the same. Uh, substantially similar is good enough. And we'll talk a little bit more about what that means uh, in, in more detail later in the presentation. Uh, now, a shortcut is a sequence of game actions with a predictable result that can lend itself to being skipping through the whole process of physically performing the actions. Uh, so you can just jump straight to what the end result is. Uh, shortcuts can include loops, but not necessarily. And the reason that you hear these uh, terms discussed a lot uh, together is because they're very closely related. Uh, but I did want to call out what the difference was at the very beginning of the presentation, just so everyone's on the same page here. Uh, and, and note that tournament shortcuts uh, is, is another related topic that's described in another section in the MTR. Uh, so it's distinct from uh, the, the shortcuts that we're going to be talking about here for the most case. Uh, generally, when I say the word shortcut in this presentation, I'm going to be talking about what, what I was talking about in that previous paragraph there. Okay, so um, another, another thing that uh, I want to bring up here is that shortcuts uh, and loops are discussed in two different policy documents. They, they actually have a, an entry in the Comprehensive Rules, uh, which is at, at the time of this presentation, CR 724. However, there's also a specific rule in the Comprehensive Rules that basically says that any time the Comprehensive Rules differs from what the Magic Tournament rule says on shortcuts, uh, then the Magic Tournament rules is going to win. Um, so even though this uh, Magic Tournament rules only holds in, in tournament settings, uh, I, I've decided that for the purposes of this presentation, we're only going to cover loops and shortcuts according to the section of the Magic Tournament rules. Um, the reason being is that the, the CR and the MTR is basically saying the same thing in 99% in of cases. I'm not really sure if there is an a example I can think of uh, where they would differ, but uh, at the same time, most of the people that I'm familiar with, I think, would probably be caring about what the unified policy is. Um, so even games that are kitchen table games and not really taking place within the tournament context, um, you probably are still going to be playing according to these rules, whether uh, you realize it or not. So um, what is a loop? A loop is any kind of tournament shortcut that involves detailing a, a sequence of actions that can be repeated and performing a, a number of iterations of that sequence. So th this is a, a quote right out of the MTR. Um, all, all of these quotes at the top is going to be from the MTR unless uh, otherwise specified. However, um, we're, we're just going to go right down through uh, all, all the clauses where they uh, talk about shortcuts in, in that section. So uh, I'll have lots of examples about how this stuff works, and, and this is this is one of them. So th this card here is a loop. Uh, if you don't see it, what you can do with Seeker of Skybreak is you can activate the ability uh, targeting Seeker of Skybreak, and, and then you can untap Seeker of Skybreak. Uh, so that is a game action, and you can uh, uh, perform that game action and it's identical every time, and you end up in the exact same game state as before you perform that game action. Um, so why, why do loops exist? And, and this is the, the reason why. Um, the, the reason is because if you have a Seeker of Sky Breakout, let's say it's uh, game two, and you already won game one, and there's maybe 10 minutes left in the round. So... I'm going to go ahead and activate my Seeger of Skybreak, targeting Seeger of Skybreak. I'm going to go ahead and untap. I'm going to go ahead and activate Seeger of Skybreak. And we're going to keep on doing this for the next 10 minutes. Uh, so obviously nobody wants that to be a thing that it's legal to do, right? No, nobody wants to live in a universe where it's legal for someone to physically tap and untap their Seeker of Skybreak for 10 minutes straight to time out the round. Um, but hey, you know, that's a legal game action, right? Like it's it's legally allowed for you to do that. Uh, so we need some kind of a framework to, to be able to politely tell people that, that that's not legit. Um, and so this is the framework that we have. If you are in a situation that is demonstrably a loop, uh, a player or the player's opponent can insist that we shortcut through the loop. And uh, in that way, we, we just jump straight to the, the predictable outcome without having to go through all of the, the intermediate steps. 
Okay, so why is that important? Well, you know, obviously it stops the the scumbag seeker of Skybreak uh, situation from uh, from happening. Um, but you know, there, there's like a lot of other uh, important consequences too. So, for example, it makes it possible for uh, infinite combo deck to function, right? It, it wouldn't really make sense to to play an infinite combo deck if you had to actually physically perform the actions every time and you couldn't just like say, okay, now I'm at a million life or, you know, now I have a million creature tokens or wh whatever the case may be. So that, those are, those are the two like major reasons why we have a shortcut policy in the, in the first place. Is, is it perfect? Uh, no, no policy in magic is perfect. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about a couple of situations that this one doesn't, the, the current policy doesn't handle particularly well according to, to my point of view um, later on in the presentation too. So, okay, at any point in the game, uh, a player with priority can suggest a shortcut by describing a, a sequence of game choices for all players uh, that can be legally taken based on the current game state and the predictable results of the sequence of choices. So, um, the important thing that I wanted to point out about this rule here, this is from the comprehensive rules, uh, is, is that the player has to, uh, the player who's proposing the shortcut has to be able to describe what the shortcut is, right? So, even if I happen to control all five of these cards and I know that somehow there's a way for me to draw cards from my deck as much as I want, um, that's not enough. I have to be able to physically uh, take the actions at least once or at least describe what it would look like if I were to physically take these actions at least once. Um, and so if I'm not able to do that, it's not a valid shortcut. Um, now, of course, my opponent is within their rights to look at my board state and say, oh, you know, okay, I recognize those five cards, uh, so I know that that's a, a infinite combo, so okay, I scoop. They're, they're definitely within their rights if they want to do that. However, uh, by the same token, if they want to say, you know, I want to see you play it out, uh, that's, that's their right also. So if you have an infinite combo, it's, it's not, that's not enough. You have to be able to say how your infinite combo works. And if you're interested in how the, the KCI combo works, uh, I did a whole video about that uh, a couple of years ago, so I'll, I'll put a card up on screen. Uh, you, can, you can check that video out if you're interested in it. So here are some of the rules that we have that, that describe what will happen in, in, a, in a loop to, to figure out what the outcome should be. So if no players are involved in maintaining the loop, each player in turn order chooses a number of iterations that they're gonna perform before they take an action that breaks the loop. Uh, or they can say that they want to take no action. And if all the players take no action, the game is a draw. Uh, otherwise, the game goes through the lowest number of iterations and the, the person who chose that number takes an action to break the loop. Wow. And, and, and by the way, there, there's like, there probably like between five and 10 of these different clauses. And they're all, they're all like this. So um, I don't know how people read this uh, these rules and policy dot well okay I, I do know because I, I do it myself but like I, I I really feel for the people who have to like go in blind not knowing like all the the background behind all this stuff and, and still have to try and slog their way through it so yeah we've got some examples for you don't worry so for this one the example that I picked is is world gorge dragon plus anime dead and if you've never seen this combo before um, the way the way that this one works is you play the anime dead uh, targeting the world gorge dragon in your graveyard world gorge dragon comes back into play um, and then the animate dead is going to get exiled along with all your other permanents. And so what that means is that because the animate dead left the battlefield, you have to sacrifice World Gorger Dragon. So we sacrifice World Gorger Dragon, which brings all your permanents back, uh, at which point the animate dead is back on the battlefield again. So uh, those, those two permanents is going to keep cycling in and out. And given that you have no other creatures that you can target with the animate dead uh, to, to reanimate, well you're, you're going to be stuck in this loop forever. Because if you notice, none of these actions uh, are optional. They're all mandatory. And so if there's no other creature that you can choose with Animate Dead, um, we're stuck in a loop. And no players are involved in maintaining this loop. In other words, there's no decisions being made by either player uh, that could be changed in order to not make this loop happen. Uh, now, the interesting thing is... Um, when, when you look at this at this rule, it says um, each player chooses a number of iterations to perform before they will take an action to break the loop. Now, if neither player is involved in maintaining the loop, how, how could a player break the loop? And the, the answer to that question is, uh, well, maybe one of the players has something like this Tormod's Crypt, right? So if you had a Tormod's Crypt in play, it would be possible for you to break this loop, right? Because 
you could an activate the Tormod's Crypt in response to the uh, Animate Dead bring the World Gorger Dragon back. Uh, and then the World Gorger Dragon just couldn't get back. There, there would no be, or there, there would not be any uh, uh, creature getting brought back with the Animate Dead, so the, the loop would be broken. Now, what this rule here says, though, is that if no players are involved in maintaining the loop, which we already established that that World Gorger Dragon plus Animate Dead loop uh, that we talked about before, no player was involved in maintaining that. So even if one of the players has a Tormod's Crypt, they are not required to activate the Tormod's Crypt to break the loop. And so that, that could for sure come up, uh, right? Because like if Amy doesn't like her spot in this game uh, and there's no other uh, creatures besides the World Gorger Dragon, she could just play the Animate Dead, draw the game, um, and then you know go, go on her merry way to the next game. So uh, yeah, that, that would be how, how this specific situation would, would turn out, okay? So, okay, another, another uh, real classic one here. If, if one player is involved in maintaining the loop, then they choose a number of times that they're gonna go through the loop. And then the other players can either say, yep, that's okay with me, uh, or they can say a lower number where they wanna intervene. And then the game advances through the lowest number of, of iterations, uh, and, and then the player chooses that number receives priority. Okay, so for, for this one, I chose uh, another, another, really classic, um, another really classic combo here, Deceiver Exarch. Uh, we're going to enchant it with a Splinter Twin, and then we're going to activate the ability to put a Deceiver Exarch token into play. Um, and then after that, the Deceiver Exarch token is going to have a triggered ability. So when it comes into play, we're going to untap target permanent, which is going to be the Deceiver Exarch. And so we're going to tap that to make some more tokens. And so in, uh, in normal play, you would say something like maybe I I'll make a million tokens, right? Now that's shorthand. If, if you wanted to be 100% uh, super duper accurate with, with what we were doing, um, that, that would be shorthand for saying something like, you know, here's the loop where I get the first token uh, as described what I was just talking about. Um, so that's me getting the first token. Now I'm gonna repeat that loop until I have a million tokens, right? And then we're gonna go to um, the the part where I get to attack, right? So that that would be that would be uh, I'm attacking for a million. You know, if if you, if you said that, that would that would be like a more game technical correct way to say that. So okay, this this is a loop that one player is involved in uh, maintaining, right? Because only the Deceiver Exarch player is is making any decisions here. The the uh, other player is, is just like passing priority, right? So Deceiver Exarch player is going to make a million tokens and then probably attack for a million. So the other players in turn order can either agree to that number or they can announce a lower number after which they intend to intervene. So maybe maybe the uh, enemy player is going to say, okay, wait, after five tokens, I'm going to intervene. Um, and and why, why would we wait until five tokens? Well, because Rakdos Charm was a really popular uh, hate card that, that you could play against this combo deck. And so you wanted to make sure that they had enough creature tokens in play that when you had each creature dealing one damage to its controller, it would be lethal. Um, but at the same time, you didn't want to let them get enough creatures so that they could attack you for lethal if they happened to have like uh, a counter spell of some sort for the Rakdos Charm. That, that way you could uh, use your removal spell, uh, which would be your like second line of defense. Um, and then maybe they wouldn't have enough creatures to kill you uh, with their attack, uh, but at least um, you wouldn't be dying either. So that, that was like kind of the idea is, is um, you don't have to uh, agree to the, the million tokens. You could, you could stop them at any lower number. So for example, five, um, and then let them get the five tokens, which is you know enough for the Rakdos charm to kill them. And then you can intervene. Uh, so so that, that would be an example of that. Uh, another, another thing is uh, a player intervening during a loop can specify uh, that one iteration is only partially performed uh, and then takes the action at the appropriate point. So usually if you did have a kill spell, uh, what you would want to do is probably play the kill spell in response to the Splinter Twin uh, ability getting activated. Um, and so that that would, in most cases, be the, the best time to intervene in terms of um, if, if they had a counter to stop your removal spell or if they had some way to interact with your removal spell. Uh, that, that would be like the, the strategically best time uh, for, for you to deploy the removal spell. So uh, again, that's totally within your rights to do that. You are able to pick whatever time in the loop that you would normally be legally uh, allowed to cast the Abrupt Decay. You're not forced to wait until the end of uh, a specific cycle that uh, that they're describing. You can intervene at any point you legally would be uh, allowed to during that cycle. Okay, so that's good, that's good. 
Um, next, we're going to move on to, uh, we, we already had like if, if no players are involved in, in maintaining the loop, and then if one player is involved in maintaining the loop. So now, of course, we, we've got uh, if two or more players are involved in maintaining the loop. Um, so with, with this one here, um, Amy's gotten Omniscience out, right? So all her spells are free. All, all, all Amy spells are, are going to be uh, casting, you know, cost, cost zero to cast. So Amy's going to play an Intuition, and with the Intuition, she's going to get another Intuition, a Cunning Wish, and an Emrakul. And a lot of the time, you know, you, you would just get, like, enough cards to that, that would guarantee that you win the game, but sometimes you don't have enough, like, win condition cards left in your library, so you have to do something like this. Um, so Nick, Nick's not a dummy. He knows that if he gives her the Emrakul, then she's just going to play the Emrakul for free and then take an extra turn and then win. So, you know, that's no good. Uh, we know the Cunning Wish. Uh, a lot of the time they're going to play some really scary instant cards in their sideboard. If we give her the Cunning Wish, that's probably going to be uh, game over also. So we're pretty much forced to give her the Intuition, right? So, of course, if you do that, then what's going to happen is the Emrakul and the Cunning Wish is going to go to the Graveyard. Uh, along with the intuition that you just finished casting. Um, and then the Emrakul trigger is going to shuffle everything back in. So the intuition that we gave Amy, Amy's just going to cast the intuition again uh, and get the same three cards. Uh, and then we're going to keep on doing this little dance until we call a judge. Right? So what will happen in, in this case? Which, which player is going to be forced to, to do something different? So if two or more players are involved in maintaining a loop within a turn, each player in turn order chooses a number of iterations to perform. So, you know, each player is, of course, within their right to, like, attempt to do this as many times as they want. But, of course, like, um, you're, you're not going to want to continue in the loop in this case, right? You're, one of the players is going to want to uh, get something other than the intuition out of this, and the other player is going to want to continue in the loop. So what's going to happen is the game is going to advance through the lowest number of iterations, uh, and then the person who chose that number receives priority, or in this case gets a, a an a warning from the judge to, okay, now you have to pick something different, right? So let's uh, take a look at exactly how that works. And it's not exactly clear how it might apply to this situation. So I, I pulled the one out from the comprehensive rules, which I think makes it a little bit more clear how this one's going to end up. So sometimes loop can be fragmented, meaning that each player uh, performs an independent action that results in the same game state being reached multiple times. Uh, if that happens, the active player... Um, has to make a, a different game choice so the loop does not continue. So in, in this case, Amy uh, would, would be, the, the burden would be on Amy uh, to, to choose different. And if you, you look at the, the rule we cited on the previous slide, uh, it, it's, that's what would happen in this rule too. So uh, each player in turn order chooses a number of iterations. So no matter what, the, the active player has to choose how many iterations they're going to say first. And then the non-active player can just say one more than that. Um, and so therefore the, the active player is always going to be the one uh, who said the lowest number of iterations and the one who gets priority afterwards. So it, it, it does turn out that these, you know, are equivalent, but it, it might take a little bit of thinking to, to, you know, get that. And if you hadn't seen it before, then I wouldn't blame you if you, if you didn't see that right away. So, okay, the, the way this works is then that Amy, the, the active player, is going to have to not play the intuition and, and like continue on, on in the game. Um, but of course, like with this one, it actually works out okay for Amy most of the time because like the, the intuition, the kind of wish is both instance. Um, so if, if, uh, this was to come up, Amy, all she has to do is like wait until next turn and then she won't be the active player anymore. Uh, so when she plays the intuition, uh, Nick tries to give her the same, uh, uh the same intuition back. Uh, now, now Nick is going to be the, the one who's the active player. So it's, it's his turn to have to do something different. So. Um, in, in this case, you usually would still win, um, but but not not that turn, and that could be important. So okay, um, finally um, we we've got a, another kind of loop that that I wanted to talk about, which is the non-deterministic loop. Uh, so I, I ended up did uh, I, I did have a, a whole video about the the four horsemen combo, which is what this is called. But I'll I'll kind of briefly recap how it works here. Uh, with with a mesmer with mesmeric orb out, um, you can activate the basalt monolith for three mana and then use that to untap Basalt Monolith, which means you can just mill a card from the top of your library however much you want. And um, so the decks that did this would have like three Narc Amoebas and uh, Dread Return. And the, the goal was we want to mill the three Narc Amoebas and the Dread Return so that we can flash back the Dread Return and, and then like win from there. Like uh, there, there'd be like some kind of way you could win given that you are flashing back the Dread Return. Uh, so... 
you also would have the Ember Cool. Um, and the, the, the Ember Cool would be there so that like if one of your combo pieces got like discarded or something, you could recycle it and then, or, or maybe counter, uh, you could recycle it and like try again. So, but um, the, the, the problem is that if you have an Ember Cool in your deck, then when you're milling yourself, and, and remember you can mill yourself um, as many times as you want. Uh, if you are to ask a mathematician about this question, um, then they would say, yeah, yep, if, if I can mill as many times as I want, then for sure we're going to get to a game state eventually where I have my Dread Return in my graveyard, my three Narc Amoebas out, and my Emrakul is, is uh, still in my deck. Hasn't, hasn't like messed my graveyard up. So, and, and that's true. Like eventually you will get to a situation that's that board state. But the problem is that we can't say how long it's going to take before we get to that game state, right? So um, with that being the case, you, you cannot shortcut this. You, you can't say, okay, so I, you know, now, now that I've demonstrated that I can just mill myself whenever I want, um, I'm just going to get to the point where I have like my, my Narc Amoebas out and my Dread Return and my like thing that I want to reanimate in my graveyard. You can't shortcut to that point. And in fact, uh, what, what's going to happen is if you keep on milling yourself and you do hit the Ember Cool, then you're done, right? Like it, you cannot mill yourself anymore because uh, it says uh, a player attempting to execute a non-deterministic loop must stop if at any point during the process a previous game state or one identical in all relevant ways is reached again. And so what that means is if you mill the Ember Cool, then you have to stop. Now, there is some, uh, uh, so, some other kind of misconceptions about this combo that I uh, maybe I, I heard about since I made my video about it and I wanted to, to address. So first of all, if you draw a card, uh, then we're back, we're back on. And the, the reason that you can continue to, to execute the loop now if you draw a card is that of course, maybe the card you drew was Emmercool. Could be, right? And until your opponent doesn't know for sure that it wasn't the Emmercool, uh, then, you know, as, as far as we know, we, we might be in a different game state. So you would be allowed to, to continue to execute the loop uh, again in, unless you hit the Emrakul. Uh, another thing is um, if, if your only goal is to get the three Narc Amoebas in your, uh, in, into play, you can do that guaranteed, right? Because you, you could activate the Basalt Monolith in response to the Emrakul trigger. So like if you mill the Emrakul, you could respond to that by milling yourself some more cards. So you could guaranteed mill all of your Narc Amoebas in one shot. And that would be okay. You could get all three of your Narc Amoebas into play. But uh, as far as getting your Narc Amoebas into play with also having the Dread Return in your graveyard, that is not something we can determin deterministically do. Okay. So uh, another kind of interesting thing is maybe we don't have the Emrakul. Maybe we have Progenitus. And of course, like the, the real decks that played this would not have a Progenitus because that doesn't fulfill the purpose that Emrakul fulfills, which is getting to recycle our combo pieces if they end up in our graveyard. Uh, but you know, for, for discussion purposes, Progenitus is actually a really interesting card, right? Because if you notice here with Progenitus, it doesn't shuffle your whole graveyard back, it only shuffles just itself. And so what that means is every, every mill that we do is gonna guaranteed leave our library the same or make it smaller. It'll never go up in size. So it seems like maybe once we hit the Progenitus, we should be able to keep going. Um, but it, it turns out that that's not the case. Um, and the, the reason is because, um, again, it, if a player is attempting to execute a non-deterministic loop, they have to stop if at any point during the process a previous game state is reached again. And so if we mill the progenitus and shuffle it back in, then that's the exact same game state as what we had immediately before we milled the progenitus. Um, so, so that indeed would fall under this rule and you would have to stop at that point. Um, it, it is kind of sucky that, that this kind of cool combo is, is getting stopped by the, the shortcut rules, but until somebody comes up with a, a better shortcut system that doesn't have this problem, I guess this is what we're kind of stuck with. So, okay, that's, that's that example. Um, some loops are sustained by choices rather than actions. And we kind of saw this a little bit before we had a sneak peek, um, when we were talking about the, the cunning wish plus intuition scenario. Um, but for, for this specific one, I, I wanted to talk about illicit auction plus platinum angel. So the, the idea would be Amy's going to play an illicit auction, right? And, and she's going to want 
to gain, gain control of Nick's Platinum Angel, right? So she, she plays the illicit auction and says, I'm gonna bid a million life. Okay, Nick is at zero life, so he knows that if he loses control of that Platinum Angel, he's gonna lose the game. So he says, okay, I'm gonna bid a million and one. And then Amy raises the stakes here, she's gonna go up to a million and two, and then the players are gonna call a judge because they, they realize that you know, they're, they're not gonna really get anywhere. So what, what would a judge do? And so in this case, uh, we, we notice that uh, so, some loops are being sustained by choices rather than actions. In this case, the loop is being sustained by each player continuing to top the high bid, right? Now, th this is indeed a loop, uh, right? Because remember, the, the game state doesn't have to be identical. It just has to be the same in all relevant ways. And I think if you asked most judges, they would probably agree uh, that there really isn't a relevant difference in between the high bid being a million and a million and one and a million and two. So this is indeed a loop. Um, the, the game state isn't really changing in a meaningful way. Um, so with that being the case, what do we do? Well, the rules above may be applied. So this is, this is a, a, a loop where both players are uh, uh, contributing to it. We need decisions from both players to continue uh, being in this same loop. Uh, so what that means is that, uh, again, like what we had in the, the intuition situation, the active player is going to be responsible for making a, a game action that does not keep us in this loop. Uh, so that means that Amy would be uh, forced to not bid, uh, and, and therefore Nick would uh, maintain control of the Platinum Angel. Uh, he would lose a million and five life or whatever, uh, but... Uh, at the same time, uh, he, he's not going to uh, lose the Platinum Angel. So a, a couple of other uh, um, related points about this, this specific ruling, uh, not related to infinite loops here, but um, number one, it is possible to bid life that you do not have. It's not possible to pay life that you do not have, but if you look at what illicit auction is asking you to do, uh, that is not part of what it, you're being asked to do. Uh, so you can you can bid whatever number you want. Uh, there's no rule against that, and uh, you you lose life equal to the high bid. So you know it, it's certainly it's possible for you to lose a million life. Um, so yeah, the the bidding a million life that's definitely a legitimate thing that you could do. Uh, the other thing is uh, state based actions are not going to make you lose the game uh, for having zero or less life until after the illicit auction finishes resolving. Um, and so that that means that even if uh, you you uh, lose a million life. Uh, you aren't going to lose the game necessarily uh, because the the platinum angel is is going to go under your control. So which, whichever player loses a million life is going to control the platinum angel at the end of this, and so they will not lose the game then and there. So that that's uh, that's also an important point to know about about how this one will work. So okay, that's good. That's good. Uh, next, ooh ooh, this is a this is another kind of really interesting one. So loops can span multiple turns. So for this situation. Uh, we've got a progenitus, and um, like most decks that play progenitus, we can't cast it. Uh, but what we can do is discard it. And so we, we have progenitus and seven other cards in our hand, and there's no cards in our library. So, But you know, every turn we can draw the progenitus and then go to end step, uh, go to clean up, and then discard to maximum hand size, and then progenitus is going to get shuffled back into our library. Okay, so that's good. Now, the other player has no way to stop us from doing that, but what they do have is an Academy Ruins and a Mox Opal. And the uh, uh, player also is going to have another Mox Opal in their graveyard. So we, uh, the Progenitus player has no way to stop the Mox Opal player from drawing the Mox Opal, playing it, and then using the Academy Ruins to get whichever one got Legend Ruled to the graveyard back on top of their library. Um, so both players are in a spot where they can't lose the game, essentially, right? But um, not, not really in a position to be able to win the game. They, they just are in a position to not lose per, for as long as they want. Uh, so what, what, can, what can we say about this? Well, loops can span multiple turns if the game state is not meaningfully changing. Uh, note that drawing cards other than the ones being used to sustain the loop is a meaningful change. So if we were drawing other cards, like, you know, maybe... maybe uh, um, one of the players um, actually has cards in their life. Like the progenist player might maybe doesn't necessarily uh, have an empty library. Maybe they're drawing like actual cards 
uh, during some of the turns. So that would not be a loop that you could shortcut through. Uh, that'd be one uh, that, that you would have to keep playing and, until you know someone either got bored and conceded or until we actually did get a game state like the one that we're talking about now. Um, but in, in the, the case that we originally presented, no player is drawing a card other than ones that are being used to sustain the loop. Uh, so if two or more players are involved in maintaining the loop across turns, each one chooses a number of iterations to perform or says that they're going to continue indefinitely. And if all players choose to continue indefinitely, the game's a draw. Uh, otherwise, the game advances through the lowest number of iterations and whichever player chose that gets priority, at which point they have to make a different game action. Uh, so in this case... Uh, both players are probably going to be choosing to continue indefinitely, and, and that would mean that the game would be a draw. Um, but uh, alternatively, someone might say, well, you know, after 5,000 iterations of this, I'm going to do something different. At which point, you know, they, they could say that, and then they would have to do something different. Um, so, yeah, that that is how that one would be uh, ending up. So, this is another kind of... Uh, um, you know, that, that's all the different types of, of uh, you know, guidance that we have in the MTR. So I've, I've gone through like all the different uh, clauses in the MTR that relate to loops. And um, th those are the examples that I came up with to kind of illustrate the meaning of all of those clauses. So now we've got uh, a few challenge questions here. So this is the first challenge question. And it's the, a very similar situation to the previous one. Um, you know, we've got the Mox Opal Academy Ruins player um, and nothing, nothing's changed about their situation. Uh, except uh, we, we also have the, the Gideon of the Trials player uh, taking the place of Progenitus player. So we don't have the Progenitus player anymore who's like discarding the Progenitus every turn. What we have is we have Gideon of the Trials and the Emblem. And, uh, you know, the Mox Opal player, usually those decks would play an Ensnaring Bridge or something. So we're, we're going to assume that the Gideon's not going to be able to attack. Um, but uh, other than that, it's the same situation as in the, the previous question. So what would happen? Um, you know, you can take some time to think or pause or uh, whatever you want, but uh, they, the answer to this situation would be, um, in this case, it's actually different uh, from, from the previous one. And the reason is because uh, with, with the previous one, we specifically said that uh, uh, if two or more players are involved in maintaining a loop across turns, uh, but for this, for this case, it's a little bit, uh, that's not the case, right? Because the uh, Mox Opal player is still involved in maintaining this loop, right? They, they still have to play the Mox Opal, Legend Rule the Mox Opal, and then put it back on top of their library uh, with the Academy Ruins. So they're taking game actions that contribute to us staying in this loop. Gideon player is not, right? Gideon player is just looking at his empty library sadly, uh, looking at his Gideon sadly because it can't attack, uh, and then saying go. And so the... Only one of the players in this situation is involved in maintaining this loop. And so what that means is that the one player who is involved in maintaining this loop is going to be forced to say a number of times that they're going to continue to uh, be involved in this loop. And then we're going to go through that many iterations and then that player has to stop. And what that probably means is that the Mox Opal player is going to lose this game. Um, and the Gideon of the Trials player is going to win because Gideon of the Trials isn't involved in the, the loop. So um, uh, this is an, another kind of situation that I feel like, you know, maybe it's not the, the, the best possible outcome because to me, uh, it doesn't seem to me like Gideon of the Trials player has like a stronger uh, claim that, that they have a, the ability to win this game. Uh, so, you know, to me, this one, I think the best possible uh, shortcut and loop system that Magic could come up with would, would make this be a draw just like the previous case, but that is not, in fact, what would happen. The, the Gideon player would end up winning in this situation. Um, okay, so that's that's kind of interesting. Um, another, another kind of interesting situation that I uh, came up with is, uh, this is challenge question number two, uh, what happens? So, Amy has a Nexus of Fate and no other cards in her library. So she's not looking too good, um, but she does have seven mana. So she can play the Nexus of Fate and take an extra turn after this one and then shuffle the Nexus of Fate back into her library and then, you know, continue on from there. So Amy is going to take all the rest of the turns in this game, uh, but those turns are going to consist of her drawing the Nexus of Fate, playing it, and then shuffling it back into her library, which would only have Nexus of Fate. 
So you know what what happens? And uh, again, in this in this case, um, we we have a, a situation where um, there's one player who's involved in maintaining this loop, right? So Amy is the only person who's involved in this loop. So eventually, she is going to have to make a game action that uh, is different from the uh, game actions that uh, has, has been taken before. And so uh, in, in this case, Amy would not be able to continue taking all the rest of the turns. And, you know, I guess thank goodness for that. Right. Okay. Um, here's another one. Um, th this one I have to say is, is got a special place in my heart because um, th this combo was in the first standard deck that, that I played, like the first serious standard deck, I suppose. Um, so Mephidros Vampire and Triskelion. If you have both of these cards out, uh, at the same time, then your Triskelion will have the ability, whenever this deals damage to a creature, put a plus one, plus one counter on Triskelion. So, of course, then your Triskelion is going to be able to remove a plus one, plus one counter to deal one damage to an enemy creature, and then that causes a plus one, plus one counter to be put onto Triskelion. Um, so, the, the what happens question here is a little bit, um, you know, maybe misleading, but I, I included this example because I wanted to point out that, like, not all loops are infinite. Right, like, there's no there's no way we can go infinite with with Mephidros Vampire plus Triskelion. Uh, but what we can do is we we can say, okay, I'm gonna kill all your creatures, um, and that, that's gonna be like a shorthand for I'm gonna ping your creature for one, and then I'm gonna put a counter on Triskelion, then I'm gonna ping it for one, then I'm gonna put a counter on Triskelion. So this does satisfy all of our uh, criteria for what a loop is, right? So you you have a definite start. Uh, or you, you have a definite end state um, and it's a predictable end state and you can deterministically get to that end state from just activating the uh, abilities, you know, taking legal game actions that, that you normally would be able to. So, so this, this is in fact a, a loop and you would in fact be able to shortcut through it and um, you know, that it works just the same way even though it's not an infinite loop. Uh, it, it just, it just uh, is a you know, kill all your creatures kind of a loop. So I thought that was kind of a fun example. And, and again, I, I really like this one because I, I have a sentimental attachment to this combo. Um, this is another uh, really interesting one. Uh, actually, a very, very interesting one. So uh, the, the question is, like, I have an omniscience in play, right? So again, all my spells are, are going to be free. Now, what I want is I want to play the Petals of Insight and, you know, rearrange the stuff on bottom of my library um, and then return the petals to my hand. And I want to keep on doing that over and over and over until eventually um, my deck is like stacked however I want and the three cards that I get off of petals in, in sight is like two Force of Wills plus a, a Cunning Wish or something, you know, some, some win card and two Counterspell backups. So is this possible? And, uh, you know, the, the first thing that we uh, have to know is that it is not possible if the number of cards in their library is divisible by three. Right, because if, if the number of cards in, in their library is divisible by three, then there's like a finite number of you know combinations that that they can have, right? And and if a card is in one of those, you know, if if you, you can get one of those sets of three cards, but it's not possible to change what cards are in each set of three that you look at with the petals of insight. So if the number of cards in your library is divisible by three, it is not possible to uh, you know arbitrarily pick what three cards you get with the Petals of Insight. You would have to settle for one of the possible, uh, you know, sets of three cards that it's possible for you to get by picking up the top three and putting them on bottom. On the other hand, if you have a number of cards in your library that is not divisible by three, then it would be possible then uh, for you to, by manipulating what order you put the three cards back in, uh, when you cycle around to see the those cards the next time, it's not going to be the exact same three cards. It's going to be like two of those cards being the same, but like one different one being thrown in there. Uh, so it turns out that if you uh, wanted to, you you could sort through your library and, and it would, in principle at least, be possible to uh, uh, come through and, and get whatever set of three cards you wanted. And in fact, it would be possible to sort your library um, according to whatever order you wanted and and be able to... Uh, put whatever three cards you wanted and have the rest of your deck be stacked however you like. Um, okay, so is this 
legitimate though? Uh, is it like if I am in a, a magic tournament and I say that that's what I want to do, is that allowed? And so the answer to this one is um, yes. Yes, you can in fact do this. And the reason is because unlike in some of these other situations that we talked about before, uh, specifically like the Four Horsemen one that involved a random uh, uh, or probabilistic argument to say that you would be able to eventually get to the end state that you wanted. In this case, there's actually a finite number that you could calculate uh, that is like the maximum number of times that you would need to play Petals of Insight uh, in order to uh, guarantee that your uh, library would be sorted the way that you need to. Um, I, I forget what the number is. Maybe I'll put it up on screen or something here, but some, some judge who has a computer science probably background uh, was able to work it out. And um, as long as you know, uh, you don't actually even need to really know what the specific number is, although that you know would probably help in convincing a judge that you know what you're talking about. Um, but um, it, a lot of judges would probably say you don't actually even need to know uh, you know, or demonstrate that you would be able to uh, apply the sorting algorithm correctly and sort your library the way that you need to. Um, because that, that would take quite a lot of time uh, and probably be very difficult to explain without a practical demonstration. Um, so, but the, the bottom line is there is a finite number of times that, that you could cast Petals of Insight and it's obviously it's a very big number. It's like in the hundreds of thousands. Uh, but after you cast Petals of Insight that many times, it is, at least in principle, guaranteed that your library will be sorted uh, however you would like. Um, and, and even, uh, you wouldn't even need to go to the maximum number of times in most cases. You would, you'd only need like some smaller amount. Uh, so yes, this is something you could do. You could say that you're playing the Petals of Insight uh, a bunch of times until my hand is Cunning Wish, Force of Will, Force of Will, and that would be okay. As long as your library has a number of cards that's not divisible by three. Um, so finally, uh, uh, another really interesting challenge question here, and, and I'm sure that a lot of you have probably seen this one before. Uh, a very, very popular loop to uh, go into. So the, the idea here is uh, you've got the Gitrog monster in play, um, and then there's Dakmore Salvage that's uh, in your hand. So you somehow like either discard the Dakmore Salvage, or maybe you like wasteland yourself or something, whatever, or maybe you know you just. Um, you know, have a land card go into your graveyard while Deckmore Salvage happens to be in your graveyard. So at that point, um, you would uh, dredge two and you'd be able to, to get the Deckmore Salvage back. Uh, my favorite version of this uh, combo would be um, the version where you do it in your cleanup. So for example, if you had eight cards in hand and you discarded the Deckmore Salvage, then because one or more land cards was put into your graveyard from anywhere, you draw a card. Uh, and then you could replace the drawing a card with, with dredging two uh, with, with the Dakmore Salvage. So you'd be able to do that and return the Dakmore Salvage to your hand and then you would discard again, uh, either to whatever discard outlet you had or to the cleanup step. And then you could continue to do that. Uh, but this is a non-example of a, of a loop because it's, it's not deterministic, right? Like you can't say something like, I'm going to keep on mill, or I'm gonna, yeah, I'm gonna keep on milling myself this way until I hit a X. Uh, you you would have to actually physically um, move the the cards into your graveyard. You wouldn't be able to like look through your library until you finally found your you know whatever cards you were trying to mill into, uh, and then just put it into your graveyard. Um, you you would have to actually physically you know mill one at a time each time, and then the other, uh, uh, or I guess two at a time each time. Uh, and the, the other thing is that um, you you are not able to, um, you know, do this infinite amount of times because, like, eventually you run out of cards to dredge. Um, so, so this, even though people, you know, generally play it as a loop, uh, I guess it doesn't fit in in the same exact way as, as a lot of these other combos for the, the reason that I talked about. Okay, so... That is actually all of the, the examples that I had. Hopefully this answers all the questions that everybody has regarding loops and shortcuts. And if not, you can post some in the comments. I'll do my best to uh, answer them to the best of my abilities. But uh, before I sign off, I wanna say thank you so much to all my patrons. Um, it's, it really means a lot to me to see people uh, 
you know, participating in these patron pick rulings and, uh, you know, having, having the discussions about what, what kinds of things you find interesting. And of course, obviously as a content creator, I want to make videos that are interesting to the most number of people possible. So, uh, knowing that there's at least some people who are interested enough to, to participate in this way, that, that really makes, uh, warms my heart. Um, so thanks so much to all of you. Thanks so much to all the people who are watching normally, um, and supporting the channel in other ways. And so that is all I have for today. Join me again tomorrow for another daily ruling, but until then, I hope you have a great day.